let's get going. I need to use that too. Yep, you need Man, to. I'm mic'd up like a... All right. I'm going to take a couple of minutes of our time. Let's everybody stand up real quick. Everybody stand up. Please. This, is, this will help Matt pour all of us. I saw Matt going, oh, oh my God, I, I love microbes. <laughs> okay, I learned this from Dr. Zach Bush. What we do is put your hands out like this, and we're all going to go like this, and let's do some squats. Let's do 10 of them. Down. We're going to get the big, we're going to get our bodies to circulate. Come on, we ate a bunch of food, and what's going to kill us is sitting down. We sit in the tractor. We sit in front of the computer. We sit, 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 and farmers hate sitting. Keep doing it. Keep going. Yeah. Now go up like this, up and down. You're moving the biggest muscles, and you're circling. Guess what else you're doing? You're smiling. I saw you. Even you go, I don't want to go down. I don't want to go on. Keep going. 500 more. Come on. No, we're got, you see, we're moving the big muscles down. Now go like this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 500 more. Good. You got it. Woo. You guys needed it because I was watching Matt going, oh, my God, microbes. Microbes. Don't touch. Now, NRCS staff, Chris, you did a good job, and you're a brave soul to do soil biology right after the class. Before we start, I want to give Sam congratulations. You never gave up. Number two, let's give Ellen Franz Luber a hand because you know what? It is tough to be a scientist, and he's a good one, and it takes a lot of work. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you for your work. Also to my friend Matt, putting up with me all these years. Let's also give Matt a hand. Thank you, guys. Ray and Chris, all of you. Now, let's rock. Let's go take you all over the world. There's my, my pasture maggots when I first bought them. Bought them to that part of Missouri, and they go, neighbor said, Ray, what's wrong with you? This is cattle country. And I said, where's the sign? I don't see no sign. So we started off with that. Again, let's talk about the ecosystem process. I'm going to take you all, I'm going to take you to some parts of the world. I've said to you, if you understand the processes and you understand the principles, I can take you to any part in the world and start the soil to function. Let me show you. Remember, four critical things I learned in Alan Savory's book. How do you bring sun back, capture light energy, and change it into chemical energy? Number one, feed the biology. The water cycle will come, and the nutrient. How do I know if it's all working? Shovel. Shovel. I'll show you in a sack. These are four criticals. When I walk on your operation, that's the first thing I'm looking. How much aggregation? Connected to the water cycle. Aggregation is connected to the nutrient cycle. They're all connected as a collective. These are the principles we're going to talk about. I broke them down to four. You saw, who was it that put up four principles was a while ago? Who was it, the speaker? Somebody put up four principles. Was it you, Chris, or was it, who was it before me? Alan? Yes, Alan, thank you. Guess what I added? Context! My gosh, if you forget context, context is everything. Context is you. What's the ecology? What's the cultural context? What's the social context? What's the spiritual context? NRCS employees, when you are walking into a farmer, you're walking into their world. They don't teach us that. The social aspect. We humans screw up the planet. Nature can do this by itself. But if you don't understand the social context of the community, the spiritual context, the cultural, the economic context, you've got to take all that into consideration. Diversity, diversity, diversity. Insects, animals, plants, diversity. Bring it in. It will heal itself. The other one, careful with your chemicals. Careful with your tillage. I'm telling you, if we would give farmers the wife's one cost share item is a tranquilizer gun. Oh, there he goes. He's going to go spray. He's going to go till. Take him down. <laughs> Bring him back in the house. 
My wife is sensible. She goes, husband, what are you doing with the tractor? Oh, I got it under control. We're very tasked. Farming is nurturing. Not beating it up. Community. Work within community. Don't work by yourself. Worst thing you can do. Worst thing you can do. It's too complex. It's too elegant. I have people on my speed dial I call. No one has all the answers. No one. I already told you the methods. I love this. Some of us get into technology. If you ever read any of his books, Nisam Nicholas Talib, brilliant statistician, he says, careful with technology. I want you to understand principles, concepts. Am I against technology? No, that's not what I'm getting at. Understand wisdom. Look at the goals. Understand the natural system. One thing I always talk about, your body is self-healing, self-organizing, self-regulating. The soil's the same way. What do I mean by that? Self-regulating. 1,700 beneficials for every one pest. But if you spray and you till and you destroy the habitat, there's no more self-regulating. Nature regulates itself. I used to get up in the morning and go, oh my gosh, all of us get judged by weeds. Do you know how long it took me as an agronomist to get over the weed issue? If my pastors, they see, oh my God, Ray's got weeds. You're judged, you're lazy, you're worthless, you're a worthless, dirty farmer. I used to think that the weed, giant weed, ragweed, was going to come, take my tractor, take the sheep, the wife was going to be gone. Weed took it. We forget that nature regulates weeds on its own. Pill bugs, millibeads, earthworms, eat it. Ultraviolet light destroys weed seeds. Freezing, breaking, cracking, drying, wetting destroys weed seeds. Fungus eat weed seeds. Nature's brilliant. Do you see weeds in the forest? No. Fungal communities. Once you shift the fungal communities, it shifts. Self-healing, self-organizing. The moment you till and you put a cover, guess what? It starts to self-organize. It starts building aggregates right away. Covers are not optional. Now I'm going to take you over the world. Here we are, Alejandro and I. I was asked to go do a consultant job in Dubai. And I said, so I said, if I had to take somebody with me, who would I bring? Big guns, Alejandro. Because if he can make it do in a desert, I need him. So I said, Alejandro, you and I are going to Dubai, and we're going to fly you what you deserve, first class. Business class. We're going to fly all the way, and we're going to turn the desert green. Let me show you once you understand. Now, here's the concept. I'm going to take you to a little island called Sirbani Yazi Island, owned by the, the Arab, Arabs. Very special island, 30,000 acres. It's a sacred island. And they're having problems because it's going downhill. And they can't, they don't know what to do. So they bring Alejandra and I down there to go look at it. And I'm going to take you to two extremes of the planet. I'm going to take you to an area that gets less than 10 inches. And then I'm going to fly you into Guatemala, Guatemala, where it's 55 inches, where the principles apply in the dry island, and it applies in Guatemala. All these processes work everywhere in the globe, folks. Let's get in the plane. Oh, yeah, baby. Here we go. Drinking your little margaritas, sitting there in the first class. You land into the island, and guess what? There's the island, over 30,000 acres, and they turned that island from a rock, and they started planting all kinds of trees, millions of trees, and they're dying. And it looks like this. I'm, you're not going to be able to hear everything, but at least you'll be able to see. Now, this is a promotional video, and look how... Look how wonderful it looks. They make it look like it's, it's wonderful. Can you hear it? Probably not. Okay. 
okay, but uh, Yeah, I can't take this off. The but here's the point. I want you to this is a promotional video. They got giraffes. They got I thought, well, the, the rich Arabs just want this beautiful little zoo, and that's what I thought. So I wasn't really pleased that well, we're going to help them fix the little zoo, but the the father of the, 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 um, the United Arab Emirates, he was a big conservationist, really. And he wanted to get this island back. How can we get this island back? Because it's going backwards. That's the whole point. I want you to look. They had all kinds of giraffes. They had all kinds of animals. But it's dying. The trees are dying. And they're getting overpopulation. Notice, do you see any grass under the trees? You notice that? Oh, by the way, all those flowers and that, that was taken by the hotel. It wasn't taken out on the land because you couldn't see a flower. Okay? I just want you to see the big promotional video. It makes you look wonderful. It's a beautiful island, guys. Five-star hotel. It's nice. But when you go out into the landscape, it looks like the moon. That's the way it looks. So how are we going to repair that? We're just understanding the principles I want to share with you. So let me show you what we did. Now look at the population of the animals. It exploded, no predators. So what does a cheetah have to do with an aggregate? When you take the predators out and all the grazers eat, you can't even build an aggregate. Can't bring out any plants. See, you need herbation. You need the predators. Do you know how many countries do not have a great balance between predators and, and herbivores? Australia is one of them. Hardly any predators. The kangaroos, the kangaroos are going crazy over there. So here's the island, owned by the royal family. Land is sacred to them, very linear management, top down. Do you see any soil scientists there? Do you see any soil ecologists, veterinarians and botanists? Pumping 14 million gallons of irrigated water to for the trees. They're using salinization and they're using, they have money. Money is not the issue. Understanding is the issue. A lot of the trees are dying, so what are they doing? Putting fungicides and doing all the pathogens, all the things that not to do. So how are we going to fix this? Costing more, they're shipping hay in to feed the wildlife, shipping it. Three, four hundred dollars a bale, probably. Money. They get less than six inches. Look at the temperatures. Over 10,000 animals. So how do we fix that place? This is the way it looks before. And the moment they took the predators, the reason they got rid of the predators, well, it's not good to go out to your bike and then all of a sudden the cheetah take you out. Oh, we had a great time until the cheetah took me out. So how do you separate the cheetah from the five-star hotel? How do you get this natural ecosystem correct? Fence, bringing the principles we talked about. How do I bring diversity? How do I get the soil to function? And how do I stop the trees from dying? Look at the, they have so many. First thing we talked about, we're going to have to get rid of 50% of the population of all the animals. That's brutal. You can't, every time a blade of grass comes in, it'd be gone. There's no way you can get a water cycle going. Look at the way it looks. All overgrazed. Not one straight of grass. It came from here to here, from here to here. Because they didn't understand a collective system, how it works and how nature regulates itself. Now look at this. Even the irrigated was overgrazed. Hundreds of animals on that. Did never give anything for the plant to recover. Look at the bare soils on the millions of trees, all bare ground. That's a typical look. Do you see any grass? How can you have a complete water cycle? All of it's fed by drip irrigation. One of the things I realized, it was the wrong type of irrigation system. Let me tell you how I figured that out. 
That's a good view. If I can fix that, we can fix anything. Kentucky's easy. Look at the palm trees. Here's how I figured this out. I said, Alex, I want you to stand by that tree. What's the difference between this tree and this tree? This tree is about 100 feet apart. This one's a sprinkler system. This was drip. Now I'm beginning to see aggregation. I'm beginning to see how the plants, I, I'm beginning to see the design of the soil. I want a skin. I want aggregation. I want living roots. I'm starting to get a living soil. Design started kicking in. Look what happens under a drip. Can't get enough skin. So the one of the recommendations I said, get rid of all your drip, keep the drip, and put your biologicals in there, but you're going to have to put sprinkle. Get, you're going to have to bring sprinkle into the system. So I'll show you more a little bit. And then we flew from there. Then I flew into Guatemala. Sugar cane. 55 inches dry. I'm going to show you what we did to both of them. And the same concepts applied to both areas. I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Guatemala. That's how Guatemala looks. It's a beautiful country. Majestic volcanoes. 55 inches. Dark soils. They're spending $10 million in chemical inputs a year. $10 million. They want to go regen. They want to back off on the chemicals and the fertilizer. So how do I get them? Same concepts. I'll show you in a second. First thing, education. Those are all the college-educated agronomists. It took me two visits to get to them. Agronomists are the worst to teach. You know why? They don't think like ecologists. They think like prescription givers, like I grew up. Ecology. Not putting chemicals and fertilizer out there. The rain simulator changed that. Going out there with a shovel, teaching them. All of our universities permeated the whole world. With industrial ag, chemical, it's like we teach, our, we teach the body. Let's chemo it. Let's cut it out. Nature doesn't want to be approached that way. Taught them all the processes. Here's what I taught them. Got out the shovel. First thing I want to do, if all spheres are going to work, if I want all those five spheres in the soil, if I want water cycle to work, nutrient cycle, I want to see all those spheres. I want a skin. You already talked about that, detritus. That's a skin. Forest, prairies. That lawn out there has a skin. It better be present. Aggregation. Between the skin is the zone of aggregation, and it starts going all the way down. Drillosphere, earthworms, all the way down. Rhizosphere, porosphere, all those spheres present. Oh, yes, Alan, I didn't make it up, and I was not smoking cover crops. <laughs> Dr. Hendricks, Odom, Dr. Bear, I actually read the literature, even though I've been accused of not. I read. I want to see all those fears present. I want to see them in a the pasture. I want to see them in a the cropland. I don't care. The first thing the soil starts to do, create all those fears. Spheres of influence. There's another one called the phylosphere. Phylosphere is the surface of the plant where there's epiphyte bacteria. Do you know how I found out about that? When a dairy man was going bro, he, he he couldn't get any money for his milk, got raw milk, put it in, in water, and diluted the milk, and he sprayed it on his wheat and got a 10-bushel increase. He was spraying bacteria and sugar right on the phylosphere. The phylosphere is connected to the detritosphere, the drillosphere. Everything is connected. Changed it. Powerful. I look at soil design. That's what I was talking about. Go out with a shovel. I want to see design. All of those fears better be present. All of them. If one's missing, it's your management. Now let's show you again. So inside the pores, a gratis, drillo. I don't talk to farmers like that. They'll look at me like they won't get it. Skin, drill, holes, earthworms, 
aggregates, the lungs of the soil. Root, energy flow. Look at the Amish. Get that beard, leaking exudates, pores, microbes swim in that. There's the shovel. Most powerful tool for me. First, I get the shovel, go look, and I want to see. Now, Dr. Stephen Gleesman, Agroecology, by his textbook, he talks about frequency of a disturbance, intensity of disturbance, scale of disturbance, timing of disturbance. Grazing done right is a natural occurrence. Grazing done wrong is a disruption. We need to graze. Frequency, how often do you till? The intensity, do you plow it? Do you run the disc? Intensity matters. When do you do your disturbance? Did you do one little field or did you do the whole stinking field? The way we do pest management, oh, I have an outbreak. I have an outbreak of insects and so the farmers hear it and the whole neighborhood hears it and then they spray fungicide on the whole watershed. And they did no IPM. And then we wonder why we're struggling with insect populations. Timing. If I'm going to till, when would I do it if I had to? Anybody? Before you plant. Before you plant? If I, if I run it up the field, what would I do? Oh, my gosh, I'd run it up the field. What am I going to do? I hate tilling. Do it when it's cold. Microbes aren't moving. They won't cannibalize you and eat your lunch and eat the carbon and the organic matter. That's not an excuse to use tillage in a destructive way. Understand what the microbes are doing. Now, here's what I mean by chronic stress. I can go to McDonald's if I'm desperate and I have nowhere else to eat, and I eat their burger and fry that's got 20-some compounds in it, very I'm just guessing. That's an acute stress. I can handle it. But every day eating bad food is chronic stress, chronic disease. Please understand our soils are under chronic disease mode. Sri Lanka wanted to go organic. Great goal. But they knocked the fertilizer right away, and people went hungry. I'm not opposed to the tools, even fertilizer, even herbicide. Acute. Use it with grace. I had a farmer who says, well, Ray, how do I get these warm seasons growing? Sometimes you might have to use Roundup. But you won't use it very often again once you've got your natives established. Careful with tools. They're tools. They're not the goal. Now, what happens if you apply too much manure, leave the ground bare? Mycorrhizae, first ones to give out. If you got too much phosphorus, mycorrhizae won't make an association because they're drowning in phosphorus. That told Michael Swift, talked about that in Colorado State. So if you take one out, you take the other out, and guess what? The system collapses. What Chris elegantly put, they're all connected. They're all working together. So if you till too much, you spray too much, you overgraze, what do you expect? You hurt the system. There's the shovel. Fence row, your field. First thing when I went to Brazil, pulled out the shovel. Had a bunch of agronomists with me, farming 50,000 acres. They had over 80 agronomists on staff. And I said, where's your shovel? Portuguese word for a shovel is pa. I said, where's your pa? They bring me a shovel this big. I go, you're a multi-million dollar company. And you have a shovel like this? None of the agronomists know what to do with it. All college educated. And you think our universities, oh, our universities are better. Uh-uh. Be careful when you say that. They're, most of them came to this country. A lot of the professors went back. They're very educated. They were taught the same way we were, reductionism. Look at the difference. But the shovel will tell me. Look at the aggregation. Look at the hot color. Look. You know how I compare your pastures? Go to the woods. Go to the pastures where 
You have engraved it to the dirt. It tells me a lot about you. Five minutes, conversation, walk, drive around. I already know where you're at. Observation. Back to my beloved Guatemala. Look at the soils over there where they're doing sugarcane, sugarcane, sugarcane. Blocky structure. Where's the aggregates? Those are giant grasses. Burning it, monoculture, burning up the soil, very poor functioning, disease, fertilizer, $10 million a year. Look at Brazil. That's the sugarcane field. Ellen, that's the, that's the furrow, I mean, that's the fence row. I told the agronomist, your management, nature's management. So what do we do, Ray? Covers, rotation. Same concepts we've been talking about. Change it. Look at, the, do you receive that in Guatemala? Do you know where the owner of the sugarcane mill, over 50,000 acres, do you know where the best soil was? On his own coffee farm. Covers, never tilled. Look how beautiful the biology is. All the spheres are present. Wasn't in the, the sugarcane farm. I already told you, plant and soil are one. We already talked about that. Again, biodiversity. I'm going to flip through some of this very quick because we already seen this. Okay, what changed me about diversity? It was North Dakota. That's, I, I snuck this on you because that's why I was able to stand up to Matt because Matt would have chewed me up and I said, this is what I saw in North Dakota. I went to the Jerusalem of Soil Health. They did a case study where they did plots, 1.8 inches of rain, really bad year. Then I knew collaboration is just as powerful as competition. Here's the, the analysis of all the numbers. People don't learn by numbers. They're visual. Numbers are important. I agree with you, Alan. God is mathematical. I totally agree, but I'm visual. 1.8 inches, monoculture turnip. Oil seed, dead. Now, look what happens when you put all five species together and mix them. It's the plot right next door. How did we get all that biomass with the same amount of rain right next door, same soil, same everything? They shade differently. They communicate. They work Nature is collaborative. I learned, this is when I threw my wheat graduate soil class, uh, wheat class, uh, my textbook in the trash. If you don't understand collaboration, how can we be talking about competition? There's a great paper called The Stress Grading Hypothesis by Mark Burton. It talks about when nature is under severe stress, it collaborates. Humans do the same. North Carolina, everybody was collaborating. Did you notice that? Black, white, red, pink, it didn't matter your skin. Collaboration. We compete all the time with each other, but it also, they collaborate. Oh, but Ray, that only happens in North Dakota. I've been told that many times. Oh, Ray, you keep talking about North Dakota. Guess where that is? Canada. Mix monoculture. Triticale. The power of life. No till in Tennessee for 50 years. No covers. Three years of rolling covers. That, look what happened. Rolling them that big. It went from here to all the spheres in three years. Some of those farmers are getting 270 bushel corn. Guess what? Biology modified the geology. Stratification. At the Nortil conference, somebody's idea of getting rid of stratification is, well, why don't we plow it? I said, boy, that is the stupidest idea I ever heard. It's like burning the house down to warm up a hot dog. I said, why don't you just put a cover? You know what I love about earthworms? I don't have to put diesel in them. They don't complain. They show up to work all the time. Feed them. That's all they want. 
Nutrient cycle, this is not the nutrient cycle, folks. It is a stimulant. Does it feed the plant? Yes. Am I against it? No. I'm against farmers going broke. Farmers are over-fertilizing all over the country. Easy. I can walk into your place and say, back off 20%, and you think I'm a hero. Our soil tests are wrong. We don't have time for that. Real quick, how do I, please understand, how many have seen the red trees, big ones? How many have seen that? Sonny and I were there. That's 4.2 million pounds. 3.9 million pounds come from the air. Come from the air. Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon. Those are our carbon molecules stacked upon the top of each other. You know what you guys are feeding your cows? Air. Less than 5% even comes from the soil. A majority of the biomass comes from the air. You know why I tell you that? Because people say regenerative agriculture, you're mining the soil. It's because we taught farmers there's a big little factory, a bank, that you've got to put things back. It is not a storage tank. It's a dynamic living ecosystem. Most of that, that's why it's measured in parts per million. 95 to 98 percent of that tree's mass came from the air, not from the soil. This is the mineral theory that has destroyed our country. I walked away in graduate soil chemistry. Oh, I hated soil chemistry. Hated it. Not because, maybe because I was just so, they were telling me the soil solution, water rains, all these nutrients become all of a sudden available. Does diffusion happen? Yes. What's diffusion? When the water enters, but this wasn't completely clear, <clears throat> the cations, ions become soluble. Then there's mass flow because the pump, the roots create a gradient. It flows, and then the root intercepts. You know what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that model? They left them out. Who do you think brings them out of the rock? Who do you think makes phosphorus and zinc and minerals soluble? The biology does, ladies and gentlemen. They do that. And guess what Ellen told us? What do they want? Carbon. They want carbon. He is totally right. Our soils are carbon depleted. This leads to my point here. <clears throat> All soil tests are wrong. Some are useful. You know who said that? Dr. Buzz Clute. When I first got, heard that, I go, oh my goodness, Buzz, you just got me all wound up. What do you mean by that? How can that be? Is there any soil test in the world that can tell you the complete functionality of your soil? Raise your hand. Name one. When you go to the doctor, is there one test that can tell you the complete function of you? What do you think they do? Saliva, urine, fecal, CAT scan. My gosh, your hormonal function, you're complex. So it was the same way. And we expect one sample to tell us everything? Good luck. Soil is the most complex ecosystem in the world. 50% of all biodiversity is in the soil. Chris just lined that out. We don't even begin to know, right? We're just touching the surface, literally. The Haney test, what Alan and the Haney has done, ARS, thank God for ARS. The Haney test was based on the concept of biomimicry. What does that mean? First thing I want to tell you, do not compare the Haney test with the old soil test, apples and oranges. People get very confused, even scientists. They want to compare and use this. No, total different soil test. When you go to the Regen Ag Lab, they give you the old chemistry test and they give you the Haney test. Use both of them. Don't work them against each other. But I, our, our old soil tests were based on caustic chemistry, forcing the cations off the exchange. That's not biomimicry. Biomimicry is let the gentle acid. So Rick 
got citric, malic, and acylic acids. Hey, that's what's the predominant acids. They're gentle acids. If you're going to mimic a model, mimic the plant of, of the, the root. Does it make a difference? I'll show you in a second. What I love about the Haney and what you have been working on, Ellen, is the old test, see that, or ammonium. But we're missing this. Where the Haney can pick it up with a incredible water analyzers. Plants, we've known, by the way, the Russians knew in the 1930s and 1900s that plants can take up amino acids. I read the literature. And just recently, they did radioisotope dots, and they go, oh, look, organic nitrogen in the plant. The Russians knew that before that. I read soil organisms and higher plants by the Some of the best soil microbiologists were Russians. Now we can give you credit for all those forms of organic nitrogen. We've been missing 50% of the nitrogen. Alan was right. Organic carbon, more organic nitrogen. Carbon. They can do that. Oh, this young man, very interesting. You know what makes him such a good farmer? He never went to college. He never grew up on the farm. North Carolina's corn champion right here. How do you do it? Covers, no-till, the Haney test. Biologicals, 459 bushel with 40% 40 less, 40 less fertilizer. His standard yields in the Piedmont Valley is 250 bushel corn with 50 units. Look at the plot that he does here. Very important. One thing I like about Russell, there's a lot of things I like about Russell. He's a giver. But look, at he's, he does research plots all the time. This is the Malik. Look at soybean. He's doing Malik. Haney test. Haney test. There's about a 40 inch gap right there. And then all of this is Malik 3. This is Malik and 3. Look right there. Goes back to Haney test. Um, applied down to the pound as good as we could on blended fertilizer. I think we were within a pound or two, both phosphorus, potash. Put in micronutrients. Um, he posted we this on YouTube. This how the I mean, on Facebook. Mealy 3 said to farm it. It's got Haney on both sides. There's another Mealy 3 down there. You so know what those soybeans produce? That's how we're doing it. Over and 80 bushel. If you can the Malik 30 bushel. Right. It matters what soil test you're using. So when I go all over the world, I do all these tests, tissue tests, check strips, water sensors, slate test, infiltration, shovel, all these tests together to make an analysis. Most of us are making very bad decisions because we have no science to make it with. We don't have our check strips. We won't do our zero check. We don't do any of this, and we're spending hundreds and thousands of dollars. But you got a $50,000 hat. Can't be doing that anymore. Regen Ag Lab. Now, let's go back and wrap it up with Serbani. Uh, uh, so what do we do with them? First thing I did, principles of biomimicry. Take a look for an isolated area, because I wanted to see the native seed bank. Guess what they did by accident? They fenced one area, and this is sprinkler. Look at, the, look at this, Matt. The native seed bed, without overgrade, without letting the animals in, look what came up by itself. You know what it taught me? Wrong sprinkler system. You need a sprinkler, not drip. And they spent millions of dollars on the drip. And you said, go back. You're going to have to put sprinklers under those trees. Other thing, look at that, what just came up by itself in the native seed bank. But it was over, was over so overgrazed, you couldn't see anything. When I walk into an operation, one of the first things I do, guys, fence an area out and look what the native seed bank tells you. Take a whole acre and don't graze it. and See what happens. You'll be shocked. Next thing we did is recommend get the no-till planters and drills and plant covers in between to get the cycling going. 
get those chains and create a guild under the trees and bring the beneficial insects. And then you're going to have to graze those grasses. But you're going to have to do planned grazing and you're going to have to fence all the hotels away from the areas. And then when you want to bring your tourists out there, you bring them in a, in a, in a SUV that's got bars and protection from the predators. You need to bring the predators back. You need to bring cows. Why cows? Is they have giraffes and they have wildlife over there. You think a giraffe will follow the hot wire? Nothing beats a cow. So cows and sheep go first, then you bring the wildlife to come and do the grazing. This is Chihuahua. Three to ten inches. This is Ernie Frinzen. He's grazing covers right between his pecans. We've already started doing this. We've already done this. Create a hot wire. There's the pecan orchard. Irrigate it. Plant the mixes. See what we did? No-till, covers, biology, cows, sheep, the water cycle will come on its own. You need to give it rest. Bring plants in, biodiverse plants. Look at the hot wire. So we move the cows and group them tight. Simple concept. Sam started doing that. Alejandro moves his cows 800 times. Bring the natural fertility. Simple to bring a hot t uh, just a water tub. We do that with our sheep. They can do that on a large scale with 30,000 acres. What do we do with the 50,000 acre sugar, sugar mill? Same concept. We started, there's the owner. By the way, it was Dr. Edimir Caligari that taught us how to do the mixes from Brazil. He taught me. We worked together. Oh, look, no-till right between the sugar cane intercropping. Look at that. Brazil's been doing that for years. You know what Brazil's still doing real wrong? They're over fertilizing, putting still too much chemicals. They've been doing no-till and covers way before we were. Look at the covers in between called intercropping, bringing living roots in between. Another thing we're going to do is Johnson Sue. Go to Dr. Type Dr. David Johnson, and we're using his, his vermiculture, and we're going to be sprayed on the leaves. We're going to inject it into the, into the drip line. In fact, write this down, December 17th through the 19th, we're going to have a school on how to design how we're going to do vermiculture on a large. We're having people from all over the world coming to learn how to do it and size it up because the power of biology. Dr. David Johnson from New Mexico State, look at the difference when you spray the biology on the top versus not. Look at the cotton with the biology in the furrow, in the seed, and spray it on the top. Look at the difference in sand from here to here with the Johnson bioreactor. This is, to me, the covers, the animals, and the biology, a way to get away from fertilizer completely. That's my goal. We don't have time to see this, but I want you to look at Adam York. Type Adam York. That's where the farm we're going to go. They're spraying biology on large hundreds of, of 30,000 acres. Watch his video. Another thing we have did is let the weeds grow. <laughs> Once the sugar cane's up there, it's not an issue. Let them grow. Do you know by doing that on a small scale, they saved $100,000 on herbicide? Let them grow. They'll build aggregates in between the sugar cane. Guess what else I told them? I want you to put buffer strips of pollinator strips all over the 50,000 acres that you guys manage. Guess what they did? They did it. Those are the type of people I want to consult with. They'll do it. Why would they do it? They don't get government help. They don't get cost share. They don't have an NRCS. They have themselves. Wrapping it up, 
Do you guys remember Biosphere 2? How many remember that? In our brilliance, in our intellectual arrogance, we say, well, we're going to create our own little miniature Earth called Biosphere 2. Do you guys remember what happened to it? Had top scientists, they were all excited, had millions of dollars. We're going to create our little miniature Earth called Biosphere 2. It turned out to be the biggest disaster ever. This is what they forgot. When they cured the cement, they started going in there. It was, the microbes were stripping it, all the oxygen. And then they put high organic matter in the soil. And the oxygen was being stripped, so they were suffocating. And then the plant, they were planting insects. Everything fell apart. It was a disaster. And then guess what else happened? Scientists fought with each other, intellectual arrogance. Doesn't that sound like Biosphere 1? There's only one Earth. We're not that smart. Why don't we fix our Earth? Why don't we let it help it heal itself? Again, I push you to that book. Get the five process is working, guys. You know what's the conduit? The plant. Bring diversity. It will start healing itself. It will start giving you a water cycle. It will start giving you a nutrient cycle. I can do this in New Mexico. I can do this anywhere on the planet. Don't think you can't. You can. Four principles I told you. Don't keep to mindless obedience. Question, like, you, like Alan said, you can do it in a humble, gentle way. But question. Question everything. I question NRCS all the time. That's why I was always in trouble. I'm okay with that. Question. German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche said, he who has a why will endure the how. Sam, you're a great example. You withstood. You know what happens to a lot of regenerative people? They quit too early. You never had your why correct. Why are you doing it? What is your why? Why are you here? Okay, some basic things, and we'll wrap it up that I recommend. One, understand your why. Context, context, context. Never forget the goal. Adaptive grazing is not the goal. Mimicking nature through adaptive grazing is the goal. Humility. Don't play God. I've had people come up to me and say, Ray, I want you to change my grandpa's mind. I said, uh-uh, I'm not God. Only God changes minds and hearts. You need to be ready. Have them go to the school, watch them YouTube, and it never really ever comes from a family member. You're too close. A prophet is never accepted in their own land. I'm sorry you grew up there. You're an idiot. I go back to New Mexico, oh, Ray, he's an idiot. I'm good with that. Prophet is never accepted in their own land. It's tough. Now, there is ra there's rare occasions where I see a mom and dad where the dad is incredibly progressive and lets their son and daughter make mistakes. What a parent. Live by example, guys. People watch you. You know how we're going to heal the planet? You, all of you. When you keep doing the grazing, I say, hey, wow, look at your cows. They look great. By the way, write this down, root so deep. Write this down, watch the videos, root so deep. Guess what, Alan? You know the scientists on there, and they got a $10 million fund. You know the scientist. The science is conclusive, exactly what Alan and you guys have been saying. If you mimic nature, organic matter goes up. Bird populations go up. Diversity goes up. They say 50,000. Go watch the movies. Roots so deep. They're amazing. Guess where they got the money from? Shell. So Shell, yeah, Shell gave them the money. But we have science to, huh? Oh, it was a shell, and also McDonald's, too. McDonald's, thank you. Thank you for the correction. McDonald's did. 
We have science to back off that the Bible already knew thousands of years ago. We're just catching up. We're really slow. Why is it such a big marble if you mimic nature is going to do well? Listen, learn to listen, exhort, and carry, encourage. You know what they people want, folks, especially now? Leadership. Our people are dying for leaders. And we don't have any. Very few. 80-20 rule. I want you to write this down. I want you to go listen to Simon Sinek called The Law of Diffusion, nine minutes long. Nine minutes. The Law of Diffusion, Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K. Go watch that. Do you know where we're at? We're, not, we're in the barely stages of early adopter. Barely. 1%. Once we hit 13 15%, the other 32 64% will come. You know what Simon Sinek says? Do not talk to them. Don't waste your time with the other 32%. Focus on you. Here, you're the early one, one or two percenters. We got to make you successful, and then it will spread. 80-20 rule. Do not waste your time with people that will suck up your time. 80-20 rule. You know what Alejandro does for his cows? 80-20 rule. He spends 80% of his time on the upper 20% of his herd. The lower 20% go to a freezer camp. You bring adaptive genes in. You're not running a bread and breakfast. You need to be nature, and you're brutal in culling. When I called for my sheep, I was brutal. Form fits design. I want sheep, like Gabe told me, you want animals that are shaped like me. Big barrel, short legs. If they don't have that, if they don't shed the hair, they don't adapt, they go to freezer camp. I want adaptive genes. Build community. This is not a competition. You're not competing with your neighbors. You're competing with the world. Be good at what you do. Be well read. I'd rather read the right books than spend years going to college learning the wrong things like I did. I'm not opposed to college, please. Chemistry is important. Physics is important. The hardcore scientists, if I had to do it again, I would have taken all the science and ecology, and I would have been mentored with a rancher like Alejandro. Spent two years learning with a practitioner. Now that's an education. Or learning with Matt Poor, or hanging around you. Now I would have been tickled with Ellen, because Ellen's science, but he cares. Do your own science. Don't wait for people. That's it, folks. I think, please understand, I'll leave you with this last beautiful story that I really get a kick out of. There's a Hugh Ross, who's a brilliant soil physicist. Brilliant man. He became a Christian at 12 to 13 years by reading the Bible. He grew up in a non-Christian home, and he wrote a book called Job. If you ever get a chance, you need to read that. That book is fascinating. But the reason I, how many know about the story of Job? Raise your hand. All of us should know about Job, how he suffered, and his friends weren't that great of friends. There's a little tiny scripture. When you read the Bible, every little word counts. Do you know that Job was one of the biggest grazers? 7,000, he had 7,000 huge amount of animals. I don't know if it was camels, oxen, I mean, he was a massive grazer. And there's a scripture in Job 31, he says, The land does not cry out against me. He was adaptive. He watched the natural system. The land is crying out against us, ladies and gentlemen, throughout the globe. It is crying. We're destroying it. We're destroying the biodiversity. And I remember the last chapter, of, of close to the last chapter of Job 38, when God comes down. And he says, okay, gird up your loins, Job. Where were you when I measured the earth? Do you know where darkness resides? And Dr. Hughes Ross says, Dry matter, I mean dark matter. 
talking about dark matter. The Bible knew about dark matter way before until they discovered it in 1999. Do you feed the lions, Job? Do you know all the stars by name? Oh, by the way, how does the planet hold up, Job? By the way, Job, what can you do? And Job goes, Lord, nothing. You know what I'm finding out, folks? I know nothing, and I can do nothing. The word sustain does not fit us. We can't even make a plant grow. We can't make the seed come up. All we can do is move things around. But yet, we think we can sustain. No, we can't. Uh, if we would walk in humility and observe what we can really do, it's humbling. And the more I study, the less I know. And I think if we take Job's words, Lord, I abhor myself. I know nothing. So thank you guys for today. And thank you for having me, Chris. And thank you for the amazing, you guys, you guys are that 1%. Thank you for coming today. Thank you, guys.